dear Prime Minister Söder, dear ministers, dear ladies and gentlemen, and thanks, Steffi, for the kind words. Um, what's there to add when you're following on the, as I just learned, CEO of Bavaria laying out the map to the future that ends up with a flag of Bavaria on the moon? And when you learn that you're living in the state of California here, the Sunshine State, um, I'm sorry that I have to disappoint you, uh, but I try my best to uh, step into these big um, foots there. Um, I want to talk about generative AI, and I guess it's no secret that generative AI has already started to change the future um, dramatically. Generative AI is changing everything around us rapidly. But why is that the case? Why? Is this change happening? Why is this change happening so swiftly? And what is changing and how will business, research and society overall be changed by generative AI coming about? Let's start at the beginning. Generative AI is much like the personal computer, an enabling technology, an enabler of future technology that we haven't invented as of yet, much like electricity and other enabling technologies as well. The kicker here is that these enabling technologies aren't there for themselves. They're just there for something else that you build on top. Now, you don't think about electricity unless it's not there. You're doing something with it. And the other factor here is that these enabling technologies that we're talking about, the personal computer and now generative AI, are enormously versatile. You can take your personal computer and essentially feed it almost arbitrary information, and you will find software that will be able to process it the way that you actually want to do it. Now, generative AI is special, and I think that explains why we had this dramatic pace in development of generative AI and this dramatic permeation of our society with generative AI that is unheard and unseen of beforehand. Nothing, not the internet, not mobile phones, came about and took the world by storm as quickly as generative AI. And this is because with generative AI at the front and start, you can do exactly the things that you can do with a personal computer, just much more easily, and it makes the computer, the personal computer, much more accessible. So think of generative AI at the outset as a booster, as an afterburner following up on space travel that we had beforehand for things that you've been doing all along with your computer. And the point here being it eases. It's the first time that we have a technology which is not just more powerful, but at the same time also becoming more accessible. We had other complicated technologies, technology of flight, for instance, and you know the cockpit being full of buttons and switches and so on, you need a lot of training. Not so with generative AI. And how do you teach a computer to do what you want it to do, the standard personal computer? You have to program it. As a professor for computer science, that's something that I can recommend everybody to learn. But at the same time, I know that lots of people will have different qualifications, different interests. And shouldn't it be possible that we utilize the personal computer with all its abilities, although we may not be able to actually write and analyze soft, uh, source code there? Isn't there a way to actually enable an arbitrary human being that's gifted in other domains and give it the ability to utilize the personal computer along these ways. Isn't there a way to um, get around the fact that we just have a finite number of qualified software developers? And even when you have those, they're making mistakes, uh, which we see all along. Uh, sometimes a little bit bigger, sometimes a little bit smaller, but they will eventually pan out and you will notice these mistakes. So the point that I want to make here is that the computers and us as human beings are essentially speaking entirely different languages. We don't understand each other. And this year is one of the results of that, us telling the computer something, the computer misunderstanding us. Generative AI is changing this profoundly. For the first time, we have a technology which allows us to tell 
powerful computing architectures what we want in natural language. So in a way, English, German, Bavarian dialects have become the programming language of the day. And you, like you would do with your friend or neighbor, can't just advise the computer to do something. Here's an example from Stable Diffusion, which my lab here at LMU had uh, developed, where you just write what you want to see, and the computer turns that into an image. You can draft and sketch a website, an interface, and the computer turns that then with other generative AI into the source code, into the application that you want. You can describe the code that you want or ask the computer what's wrong with your code, why you're not getting out what you want, and have the computer help you fix it. All of what you're seeing here are examples of a very new way, so to speak, to program the computer to develop applications, and this is prompt-based generative AI, where you utilize natural language to tell the computer what you actually want. All of this, stable diffusion, the GPT models and the like, are built on a very new way to actually train computers. For long, we told the computer what we wanted by presenting it inputs and the desired output. Now we've switched to what's called self-supervised learning. We present the computer just with images, for instance, and ask to complete these images. We present it with text and ask to complete the text. This is um, how all of the generative AI that you see these days is trained. But the question remains, aren't we producing just mere stochastic parrots by doing that? Machines that just bubble and repeat what we have entered in. And I would argue that what we're seeing these days is actually emergence emergence of new structure which we haven't directly fed in. Think of the training data as being tiny islands in the Pacific and what your generative AI is doing, building bridges in between these islands and creating new land in between. And we see examples of that. We see uh, that the method can be fit, uh, can be uh, input here, some standard categories and then interpolate in between and uh, create something uh, which it hasn't been told about. You probably know that uh, the machine has, or generative AI, has now um, achieved a reasonable performance on a lot of high school and university exams. And we could think that everything is fair and well, that we see an exponential growth in performance. And we have seen so over the last couple of years. But this gain in performance came at a price. And I guess that is what's now going to lead to a turning point, a price of a in significant increase in model size. These architectures, these models that you utilize, the GPT models and so on, they have been empowered mostly by just making them larger over a long time. Improve, uh, increases here of 15,000 fold over the last five years, which is massive. Why should you care about that? You should care about that because this cannot continue that way forever, and we see already indications of a flattening of this curve, and I'm just buying here into the theme of the Club of Rome of certain limits to growth being, uh, being present. What are these limits? The GPUs, the hardware that we all have to use to empower generative AI, are not keeping up with the pace that our models are growing at. There's roughly an order of magnitude, almost a factor of 10 difference in how our models grow compared to um, what we actually supply in terms of um, compute to uh, these models. And that leads to problems. Problems that are first noticed um, with smaller consumers, with smaller research labs, but which already the big tech companies and the biggest tech companies these days tend to notice. There's observations that, for instance, GPT model here or there has actually even deteriorated in performance, all of this being indications of you getting $10 billion and that not even being sufficient to just keep up with this scaling that easily. I'm, however, not by no means saying that generative AI will now stop to improve. Quite the contrary. We will see further improvements and um, also in a lot of applications out there. But, and this is the kicker here, not by merely taking what we presently have and scaling it up. 
And we haven't done so in the past. It's just that scaling has been the most persistent factor if you take like 50 years or something like that. But there have been important paradigm shifts in between. It's not that your computing hardware that you're using these days are just electron tubes on steroids. It's something entirely new. And I strongly believe that this is what we are now also going to see in the future, that after this shallowing off years taking place, we will see a paradigm shift. And we have seen this in the past. And so it goes. And we've seen examples of that. Stable diffusion here, for instance, being an example to um, democratize generative AI by making smaller models more powerful. And this here has new implications for research, but also for business and investment. It tells you that every now and then comes this reset moment. And it's not those that are presently sort of at the lead that they could just take what they, whatever they have and skate it up and solve all the problems in the future. We will need new inventions there. So that's a transformation of research and development. There are transformations now happening when it comes down to developing applications. How does application development work in general? For long, it meant software engineering, having a lot of clever people sit down, analyze a problem, devise a solution, implement a test, fail, and then repeat this loop here. What I have here in orange involves a lot of human interaction and a lot of skilled workforce. This has changed 20 years ago and is essentially what empowered all the big tech companies of the Silicon Valley, namely machine learning. Now, we are not implementing the solution ourselves, but rather we utilize a lot of data to have a computer automatically learn the code, the solution to the problem. We test, have to, however, change the learning algorithm then and go about again. Generative AI is changing all of that. In generative AI, you merely sit down, describe the problem, and have a computer then evaluate what you were describing and proposing a solution. This solution will not solve your problem. There will be a loop involving human beings, people that also understand what the computers are doing, hopefully, and then going back to the generative AI and making suggestions what you really want, much like you would with a colleague, where you say, like, hey, do this. No, that's not what I meant. Please do it a little bit different. And I believe that this has profound implications. Generative AI will, in that case, lead to general purpose, software development algorithms, but beyond just programming. Applications for, we've seen that with stable diffusion, for uh, generating renderings and similar things. With zero to no prom programming needed, and uh, something which will spur a rapid development of novel, very tailored solutions. And in that lies, I believe, a profound new opportunity for European AI. I had a lot of press interviews where the question was like, hmm, IT here, I mean, IT is typically happening in California, we have lost it, and with generative AI, or with AI, we've lost it even more. And I believe that that's not necessarily the case. We have a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises here in Germany, especially, um, and in Europe overall which are world mark leaders, potentially, even in their particular area, meaning they have access to proprietary data that all the big tech companies don't have. They have access to their direct, direct customers, but they're lacking the big resources, the big workforce, and so on. This, what I've just shown here, will enable them to devise solutions for their proprietary data that nobody else beforehand could actually do, and do so very swiftly, and enable uh, also businesses which are a little bit off the IT track to actually utilize this power. A second factor, so that was research, this was now business. The second factor that I, or the third factor that I want to tap into here quickly is our mutual communication, society, and what that means for the media as well. How do you communicate a complicated, very meaningful problem to a large crowd of people? You can't. And it's a bit tongue-in-cheek here, but it's really complicated if you take things like climate change or whatever else, new technology like generative AI, and really explain and also convince of a certain number of facts that are out there. How do you then do it? Well, if you have a crowd which is as di uh, diverse as you see here in their political spectrum, it's really challenging. But what we have done and what 
technology, machine learning, data science has been used for over the last 20 years is exactly that. Analyze your crowd and find points by means of which you can reach as many people as possible. What are these points? It turns out that it's super hard to find things that millions of people actually share. What's much easier is finding this one or two points that divide people. And if you hammer on these points, you can actually create a lot of attention by just having a single topic. And I would now say that this has been an artifact of data analysis, trying to find single tipping points by means of which you can reach as many people as possible. And then you have to turn up your volume, essentially, to reach as many as possible. There is a trade-off. Either you reach an individual, very personal, at what they actually care about, but if you want to reach a lot of people by means of this data analytics approach, you need to average. And on average, what you find, are the, easy, what you find the easiest are these um, dividing factors. And by that, you can reach a whole lot of people. And that has led to us all turning up the volume, so to speak, screaming at another with these oversimplified messages and not being able to communicate more complicated, more challenging things. However, people are much more complicated, much more nuanced. If you take either of these two camps here, for instance, you will notice that they are not all the same, that there are other dimensions to it where they differ. And if you could now address these individually. You could even build sort of clusters beyond the different camps. And a generative AI would now allow us to do just that. Take complicated messages that you want to drive home, reach people that other than that you cannot reach because now you have a much more personalized communication. Because let's face it, the only personal thing about the personal computer was you buying personally for it and you then owning it personally. But all the applications on this machine you share with your neighbor here. These were from the rack, all the applications, the content that you're consuming. Generative AI is changing this and giving us a new opportunity to reach individuals individually and with this addressing them uh, more personally, convey also complex messages. There are risks to that, that I definitely agree with as well, and I want to just merely before, because, before I close, um, show one observation here. The societal implications of generative AI are vast. Um, I uh, gave Last Republica an entire keynote on just that. Let me just single out an individual part here and ask what the implications are on us, on society and human beings. And one observation. With all things that we've seen, in particular, for instance, the question of work, what does generative AI mean for human labor force, Generative AI as a technology is essentially a magnification lens, a magnification glass for problems that we had all along. And it's just magnifying them more. What do I mean with that? If you take your human labor and demand from them speed, high volumes that they need to process, where it's arbitrary what they're actually producing and where the individual uh, person that you're having there is interchangeable, where you could take person A or person B, do the job, and that would be equally uh, good, and where what comes out has no further implications, no further consequences, then you have already replaced a human being by a machine, only that it has two legs. The question is now how we can make work more humane and concentrate on the work which is more humane, where you need the genuine abilities of your workforce rather than having to turn people into machines, um, taking uh, human beings and utilize then the AI to improve them, make them better in what they actually can do. Last point that I want to mention is risk mitigation strategies. Who of you would sit in an airplane which is a black box where nobody has an understanding how that works? Who of you would swallow a pill if I tell you nobody has ever looked into how that actually works? Probably none of you. Closed source approaches are only delaying 
but they are not stopping the proliferation of AI. And if we can agree that generative AI is a global phenomenon being developed everywhere, also in non-democratic states, it's a bit hard to stop that. And doing that closed source is probably just prolonging or delaying, but it will come about. We've seen that in the last year by means of leaks, re-implementations, and similar things as well. I would advocate here for critical technology, foundational technology to actually being open sourced, because that allows us to create awareness on the level of our societies, make it transparent, open for red teaming and the like. And if you have a closet and you know nobody looks in, it might look like that. But if you know it's open source, people can look inside, you would probably not want to create this mess. And with that, let me wrap up. Future generative AI will not come about by just scaling the things that we presently have. Generative AI will lower the bar for developing powerful software, and I see there an entirely new hope for software development here in Europe, and in particular in Germany. It can address individuals much more personally to drive complex messages home. And lastly, issues that we're presently seeing are magnification lenses for problems that we had along where we haven't done our homework in the past. Mitigation, I find it very important to look deeper into open source approaches, not for the entire package, examples that I showed beforehand with pharmaceuticals, there is money being made, although people can look into that in certain parts. Of course, their businesses should make money with that, not everything, but critical parts should be open so that we can develop mitigation strategies. Thank you for your attention.